Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Serkan, and I'm today talking about uh, the Japanese mobile games market, especially what uh, pitfalls and what kind of misinformation is uh, uh, that I, uh, you know, that I uh, see on an almost daily basis uh, being spread uh, about this particular market. Um, uh, with uh, when I talk with my clients or with people uh, that are active in the game industry worldwide. So. Um, very first, um, uh, very quickly about myself. Uh, so I am uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Kantan Games, which is a Tokyo-based uh, game industry consultancy. And I've been consulting to the game industry about the Japanese market since about 2010. And that company is uh, uh, just uh, two years old. But uh, even before uh, setting up the company, I was already doing a lot of work in the mobile games market uh, in Japan. And I've been based uh, in that country since uh, 2004, so it, it actually has been a while. So I'm originally from Germany, uh, but, um, uh, but I went to Japan and, uh, well, for, for my studies and uh, never left again. And uh, currently, what I'm doing with this consultancy is that I'm advising to two big uh, client groups. So one, I'm advising um, you know, uh, financial institutions. Uh, that are interested in investing in uh, publicly traded uh, mobile game companies, but the much bigger target group is, and which is more relevant also for you guys here at uh, Casual Connect, is that I'm also advising to uh, foreign game makers uh, that are based in the US, Europe, and Asia. And uh, this is my website, sarkantoto.com, so if you have a minute later, please visit it if you are interested in um, English, uh, English language information about the Japanese mobile games market. So I try to update it as, uh, as often as I can. And uh, yeah, so very, uh, a very quick overview of the Japanese mobile games market before I get into the myths uh, that, is, uh, that are surrounding uh, that market. Um, I think that if you talk, if you talk about Japan and uh, the landscape over there, I think uh, first of all, on the supply side, you talk about roughly 500 to 700 mobile game developers. Um, the number can be a little bit more, depends on how strict you are with the definition, and this the number doesn't include uh, hobby teams or individuals that are producing games, but just uh, more or less uh, serious uh, mobile game developers. And in Japan only, you have the situation that around 40, 45 of these uh, makers are publicly traded. So you don't have uh, that kind of situation anywhere else in the world. And six of them are la so-called large cap companies that have uh, market capitalizations of at least a billion dollars. And it can go actually up to uh, $7 billion in some cases. And we have uh, 20 plus mobile game platforms. Not all of them are very successful. Uh, but uh, I just put up that bullet point in there to just show you how big, how big uh, uh, the mobile games market is in that country. Um, because these, uh, these uh, games platforms are just focusing on mobile. And they cover the entire spectrum of uh, content um, up, until, uh, up, up to um, you know, things like adult content. And again, this is just, uh, d this is just on, on, uh, on mobile platforms. Uh, feature phones and uh, smartphones. And um, also, uh, and uh, this is um, you know, displayed in the, in the last bullet point, iOS is extremely big in Japan. So I think that this differentiates um, you know, Japan from a lot of countries in Asia. Uh, Android is also very big um, in, in, on the Japanese market, but uh, Android fragmentation, unlike in China, for example, or in Korea, where the telco app stores are really big, doesn't exist on the Japanese market. So this is, um, you know, for a lot of uh, foreign game developers that are interested in Japan, um, a relatively good, uh, good news uh, because Google Play is dominant. So th that's the primary way of uh, distributing Android applications on the, on the Japanese market. So if you think about that, if you think about the Android side in Japan, you're safe with uh, Google Play. And so this is, this is how I, uh, you know, structure, quote unquote, uh, the mobile games market on the, on the um, you, you know, on the visual side. So you basically, I think, I think that you can see it in a way that you have the, the platform layer on top of the, uh, on top of the pyramid. And the platform layer consists of companies like uh, Apple and, and Google, obviously, uh, Nintendo in the near future. And then, you know, you have the second layer in that platform layer, which consists of, uh, you know, three containers. So the first container is DNA's uh, mobile game platform and Gree platform. Then in the middle container, you see uh, the app subscription uh, programs that the three big telcos in Japan are operating that are relatively successful, actually. And then um, the third container it contains um, or has D-Game, which is a, you know, a game platform op uh, operated by um, Docomo, uh, Japan's biggest uh, telco, then uh, Line, of course, and then Ameba, which is operated by a company called uh, CyberAgent. And then you have the listed makers layer. As I mentioned, around 40 of them are um, active um, in, in Japan in that, in that layer. And you 
also have, in the case of uh, Japan, um, you know, a small container of uh, listed video game makers, you know, the old names like Capcom, Sega, Konami, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that have been active in mobile for years and that, uh, that are increasingly going mobile, with Konami being uh, the, uh, the latest uh, big example uh, of, that, of that trend. And then in the bottom, in the bo on the bottom uh, layer, you have the private makers. Uh, that consist of uh, Japanese makers, which you can see um, you know, wh where there's a selection of them uh, in, the, um, in the bigger container. And then in the small container, you have an increasingly large number of foreign game developers that are uh, pushing into, uh, into the Japanese market, and a lot of them are actually private. Yeah, so which, and this brings me to the uh, five myths about uh, the Japanese market. So the number one myth is, and this is, uh, these are all quotes that I heard over the years from uh, various um, uh, mobile game developers. So the first myth is that Japan is not that much different from uh, Korea or China or from Southeast Asia. So I don't hear, that, I don't hear this, uh, uh, this uh, quote that often, but if I hear it, it's, it's a very severe one. So because it's an intellectual mistake to think like that. Um, so as a lot of people here in the room know, um, there's no Asian gaming market. I would even say there's no East Asian gaming market even. All of the countries are very, very much different from each other. There are some similarities um, you know, in, some, in some East Asian uh, markets, for example, but uh, Korea, China, and uh, Japan are not really the same thing. So it's an intellectual mistake if you enter the, uh, if you enter the Japanese market or any, or any of, the, of the other top markets in, in, um, in, um, in, in Asia when you think that you can basically lump them together. And so if you look at the top grossing rankings, for example, so this is, a, this is a, an overview of, of Japan, which is completely different from uh, Korea, where Kakao Talk is uh, dominating uh, a lot of the top spots, and which is also very, very different from uh, China, where Tencent is, ba is basically having an iron grip uh, on, on uh, the, the app landscape. Myth two is um, Japan is the world's most lucrative mobile games market, so we have to go there. So this is what, what I hear from a lot of game developers, and I totally understand it. And I think that uh, uh, this myth is uh, generally true. So if you, if you look at the mobile contents market worldwide, so IDG is saying uh, that market is going to grow on, uh, to roughly $30 billion by 2017. Um, um, you know, and Asia is the biggest, Asia is the, is the biggest uh, driver of that growth worldwide. And Japan, as part of that, uh, as part of that uh, growth, uh, is, um, you know, is, abs is dominant, not only in Asia, but, uh, but also worldwide. So if you, if you look at this graph, which is provided by a Japanese company called uh, CyberAgent, um, uh, uh, this company is projecting uh, smartphone game sales in Japan uh, to grow to um, uh, roughly 7 billion US dollars by uh, uh, 2016. So if anybody asks you, ask you, or if you, you, you ask yourself, how big is the mobile game market actually in terms of sales, it's $7 billion, um, projected to be $7 billion roughly uh, by next year. And, but what I also t tell you know, clients or to, to whoever I, t I talk to about the Japanese mo mobile games market, that if you just look at the raw data, you know, you're on a path, uh, on a very dangerous path. So because on the Japanese market, you have the very, very unique, um, uh, you know, situation that there are two apps uh, that are, dom it's not even two companies, there are two apps that are dominating the mobile game landscape. And this is Puzzle and Dragons on the left, uh, which you can see on the left, and the Monster Strike from a company called uh, Mixi, which has uh, basically turned the monopoly that Puzzle and Dragons had for a long time on the Japanese mobile games market into a duopoly. And to give you a little bit more concrete, um, you know, data points, this is, an, uh, this is a, you know, a slide that Ga the Gung Ho president, you know, the company behind Puzzle and Dragons, showed during a recent um, financial resu results earning, uh, earnings call. And the middle, you know, the middle part of that slide shows, on the left side, shows uh, the sales that the Japanese smartphone games uh, made all of... Uh, all of Japanese smartphone um, games made in Japan in the year 2013. And Morishita-san, the president, said, we, in, in 2013, we commanded 51% of the entire smartphone game sales on the Japanese market over, that, over the entire year. So if you're a foreign game maker, and if you're interested in coming to the Japanese market, then ju just look at the raw numbers, you know, it, it will not help you. I think that you will need context like this. And you know, if you fast forward to, to, uh, to uh, today, so we, um, in May 2015, again, what I said here, 
you have a second billion dollar franchise because both, both of these games are making uh, over $100 million per month and with well over 90% uh, of that revenue uh, coming from the Japanese market. And I would say that this 51%, if you take Mixi into the mix, I think oh, you're, you're probably closer to 70, uh, 70 80%, so, something in that ballpark. And then the rest goes to the 500 to, to 700 other mobile game makers that I just mentioned. Myth three is uh, that uh, Japanese gamers spend the most money in the world. And I think that uh, this myth is uh, definitely true. So this app, any uh, chart here, shows that uh, digital content spent specifically for games is the highest, relatively speaking, uh, the highest uh, on the Japanese market. Um, and uh, Morgan Stanley has, what, th this, is, uh, this slide is a little bit uh, older, but uh, they are calculating that ARPPU per month in Japan across the board in 2013, and this is an estimate uh, by them, is 5,500 yen, which is roughly $50 per month. And you, do, you don't see uh, th these numbers anywhere else but on the Japanese market. Again, this is across the board, not for a specific uh, uh, example of a game. Um, a more concrete example is Mobcast. So Mobcast is a listed um, uh, mobile games mo uh, maker in, in, in Japan. It's a mid-sized one. It's a, they're, doing, uh, they're doing okay. And they recently showed this light to investors. They said, you know, on our so-called Mobcast platform, which is one of the platforms that I talked about um, you know, earlier, we have 55,000 paying users, which you can see on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you can see the ARPPU in yen. And they said that in December 2014, our ARPPU was, for that month alone, 7,470 uh, 7, yen, which is roughly, I think, $65 or something like that. And again, uh, these numbers are Japan only, so I think that this, uh, this myth is uh, definitely, uh, definitely true. It's not a myth, it's reality. But of course, you know, the ARPPU is not evenly dis distributed, so here uh, you can see uh, line bubble two. And you, know, you cannot achieve, even on the Japanese market, you cannot achieve that kind of ARPPU with, with every game. That's, of course, uh, I think, uh, uh, pretty much clear to, uh, uh, to, to everybody uh, sitting in this room. But again, uh, you know, companies, uh, there are several companies like Morgan Stanley, but also other financial institutions that uh, calculate with this, uh, with this ARPPU number across the board. Another myth, and this is one of my favorite ones, is that you know, our games work well uh, in, in the US and in Europe, so we'll also win in, 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 in Japan. Uh, so this is basically to say that uh, you know, whenever I talk to especially uh, bigger game companies, when I talk to the CEOs of these companies or to the, to the leaders, quote unquote, in these companies, there's so much self-confidence uh, going on, you know, they say, hey, you know, we have millions of people in the, US, in the US playing our games, we have millions of people in Europe playing our games, what is so different about the Japanese market? We will also win there. You know, what, I mean, what's the big deal about that, uh, about that, about that market anyway? We will also be able to replicate our success. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm always trying to tell, I'm always trying to tell uh, people like that, you know, that in Japan, people are, will, say, will, t uh, will say to you, who are you? Right? We are not interested in what you achieved in the US or Europe. We already have a big market over here. And um, this is why I think that this, uh, this myth is um, definitely not true. And I think this is also a pretty dangerous one, just like the, uh, just like the first one. And just to give you one example, so the number of foreign-made titles um, in, uh, in the Japanese video game market between uh, all video games that have been released on the Japanese market, which, as you know, for video games, which is uh, one of the biggest in the world, between 2001 and 2013, the number of foreign-made titles in that top 100 is zero. There's nobody. There's no Call of Duty, there's no uh, Activision Blizzard um, uh, game, nothing, not, nothing like that. So these are only Japanese games that have been, um, you know, that have been uh, making it into the top 100. I think it's an amazing number. If you look at the top, if you look on the mobile, if you look at the mobile side, if you look at the top gross, uh, 30 grossing rankings that we have right now, just on iOS for uh, you know for for, sim uh, for simplicity, only two of them are not made in Japan, and the two of them, um, uh, you know, Game of War and Clash of Clans, are not doing as well in Japan as they do in other regions. And Machine Zone, um, you know, a couple of months ago hasn't been even in, in, in active in Japan, so they're uh, they're a relatively new phenomenon. So I'm I'm curious to see how this uh, chart will is going to look like in in uh, six months or something. There's a chance that uh, a company, um, you know, an app like a Game of War w might be actually dropping out of the top 30. 
Uh, Flappy Bird is another good example, right? So a Flappy Bird, as you guys know, was a worldwide phenomenon, including here in Asia, Europe, America, everybody was talking about that game for a certain period of time. In Japan, I think it peaked at uh, top 25 of the download rankings, and then it dropped and it was never talked about again. So nobody has an idea uh, what uh, Flappy Bird even is. Um, another recent example is, um, you know, uh, Crossy Road, which is uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, mobile games, my personal favorite uh, mobile games uh, in recent months. Um, and which I'm actually very good in, by the way. Um, but in, in Japan, uh, you know, nobody basically knows this, uh, knows this game. It, it didn't really resonate with, uh, with, um, uh, with uh, Japanese users, which brings me back to the original myth that what, happen, what is uh, successful outside Japan, if you, if you have an, a successful app that is working outside the Japanese market, it doesn't mean anything uh, for the Japanese market because it's just so unique. Uh, foreign game makers active in Japan with their own offices against all odds, quote unquote. Um, there are quite a few of them now. Uh, so uh, the, a lot of these uh, popped up in the last two to three years, but I would say that uh, you know you can group them in two in two buckets. So the first bucket you can see on the on the left, uh, companies like Supercell, King, Gameloft, Gameville, and Happy Elements, which which is a Chinese company. I think these are the top five uh, foreign game makers in Japan. Again. Just, just counting those that have, um, that have offices um, in uh, Tokyo, uh, Happy Elements is in Kyoto, but uh, that have actually offices uh, on the Japanese market. And there are a whole bunch of other uh, you know, foreign game makers active, uh, active over there, but they are not doing as well at this point, I would say, as, as the so-called uh, top five. So it is possible. So you can, you can be successful on the Japanese market, but uh, there's no causality between you know, your success outside Japan and uh, your potential inside the Japanese market. Uh, myth five, and that's the, that's the last, uh, last one, is that localization is, uh, is key in Japan. So I would say that this is true to uh, some extent. So if you look at the, just, uh, just for simplicity's sake, and uh, you know, we just have uh, 20 minutes here, so if you just look at the top three apps um, uh, that are, uh, the top three foreign apps that are uh, being distributed in Japan right now, Candy Crush, Clash of Clans, Game of War, these three apps are identical in Japan and uh, the rest of the world. So there's no changes in UI, there's no changes in design, or there's no monetization techniques. So Candy Crush, for example, doesn't have gacha you know, in, in the Japanese version or something like that. They're identical. Uh, the only change has been made in translating the text. And this is what you should do in any case. Uh, translate every, uh, every uh, bit of text possible into, into Japanese if you can. But what's interesting is, is that the real localization is not made inside the app, but outside the app. If you think about areas like uh, customer support, community management, marketing, PR, uh, distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these areas should be handled the Japanese way. And in the case of these uh, three top apps, they are largely handled uh, the Japanese way, and I think that uh, Clash of Clans uh, did the best job, or Supercell did the best job when they, when they entered the uh, Japanese market. So if there's one case study uh, for a foreign game maker, for a foreign mobile game maker entering the Japanese market successfully, it's uh, Supercell. And then, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think that a warning is also in place, because I sometimes uh, speak to uh, game, game developers that are thinking about bringing their existing content into the Japanese market, and they're saying, well, you know, we can add some samurais and some ninjas, you know, and then, you know, we have these cute girls, and we can make them more Japanese and more kawaii, and maybe we can, like, enlarge the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the eyes and, you know, give them green hair and all of these things. Uh, this, will not uh, this will not be successful on the Japanese market, right? So in, in the... In the best case, uh, I think, in, the, in most cases, in the, best, in the best scenario, in the most positive scenario, you will just be ignored, and, or uh, it can backfire. Right? I, think that, I think that, as far as, uh, as I know about the uh, Chinese market, localiza uh, localization like that works in China, but in Japan, I don't know of any app that has been changed uh, to better fit the Japanese tastes and uh, that has been uh, successful over there. So I think that uh, I think that uh, strategy really doesn't work. I think that I think that uh, you know if you look at the foreign-made uh, titles on the Japanese mobile games market that are successful right now or that have been successful until now, they're basically unchanged. Um, you know when you uh, when you take the original app uh, as a comparison. Chances for smaller developers. I think I have one minute left. Um, I think that, I think that uh, so I, I will uh, be only able to uh, show uh, this slide. I think that everybody here in this room and also people uh, you know, watching the video later, uh, everybody knows that Japan is probably one of the most, not probably, definitely one of the most 
uh, 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 most difficult markets to enter uh, for foreign uh, for foreign game makers, um, and I think that even even bigger developers, you know, uh, the ones that I mentioned earlier that have a lot of confidence in themselves and in their content, are having a hard time on the Japanese market. Um, and I would say that generally speaking, if you're a smaller developer, if you're a mid-sized developer, if you don't have a a large marketing budget, because make no mistake, this is how uh, King, Supercell, and uh, Machine Zone have won, quote unquote, uh, on the Japanese market. They came, they muscled their way into the Japanese market by spending marketing yen. Right, so they didn't, you know, they didn't uh, do a, a, a smaller marketing campaigns or test campaigns or something like that. They just went in uh, with a splash. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't have uh, that kind of resources in, inside your company, I think it only makes sense if you have a great game. Uh, that, that has an innovative core concept uh, with high production value and or uh, targeting a specific niche. So because at the end of the day, it all goes back uh, to the content, right? So if you, if you have a great, only if you have a great game that fits some of these criteria, or in the best case, all of these criteria, I think you, you have a chance as a foreign game, uh, as a foreign game maker in, in Japan. Also as a local game maker, um, uh, I would add, uh, because um, the thing is that on the Japanese market, you have the most, because it's the most mature smartphone game market in the world, or mobile games market in the world, you also have the most sophisticated users. So if you come in, into the Japanese market with a Clash of Clans clone, for example, or with a Candy Crush clone, um, you know, people will be able to, um, you know, to, uh, to see that uh, you're just a clone, right? And they will all go to the original. So you cannot really fool Japanese users that easily. Um, another, another option is having a local partner and, uh, or publisher, which is uh, you know, much, much more difficult than it sounds because it's not, it's not so easy in the case of Japan. Uh, or if you, have, if you have a game where you have you know, certain monetization hooks and techniques um, where you can say, well, I mean, we don't need millions of, uh, we, don't mean, we don't need millions of users like Supercell does or like King, uh, King does. We can make you know, okay money with uh, you know, a smaller number of users. That's also fine. That, that can also work on the Japanese market. But I think that unless, unless, you, have, unless you don't have any of these uh, criteria fulfilled inside your company, uh, I would say that generally speaking, uh, Japan will be a t very, very tough nut to crack for you. And I think, um, yeah, my time has run out. But uh, thank you very much for listening. Do we have any questions for Dr. Toto? Hi there. Um, you mentioned that uh, not to forget localization outside of the game. Um, so customer support and community management being done the Japanese way. I wondered if you could just describe briefly what, what that Japanese way of customer support and community management looks like. Yeah, so so I've uh, um, so I think that a lot of my uh, a lot of the people who I talked in, in in the past they understand. But uh, uh, what I meant by that is that if you have uh, things like community management, for example, or customer support in English, it doesn't work in Japan. Right? So uh, it was a, a very conversation that I had just a few months ago where somebody um, you know game maker from the U.S. yeah a game maker from the U.S. asked me whether they can outsource uh, customer support for Japan to uh, the Philippines because English, English customer support is, is so cheap there, but, but that doesn't work. It has to be in Japanese. I mean, in, in terms of customer support and uh, community management, uh, I can be 100% firm you know, answering that question, uh, the question like that. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone publishing in Japan? So do you think that people should try to release their games in Japan from outside? Should they make that effort it, like in general, uh, even like a small developer? Right, yes. Yeah. So, so what I usually, so I, I shouldn't do, be doing that as a consultant, you know, uh, trying to help uh, people getting into the Japanese market, but I usually spend a lot of time trying to uh, talk people uh, out of getting into the Japanese market, right? I should be cheerleading it and say, hey, yeah, of course, you know, you should come and you can make a lot of money. Look at the app, any numbers and, and things like that. But, uh, but I think that generally speaking, I think that you should, uh, you should consider, uh, you know, uh, Japan only if one of these criteria is fulfilled or if you have uh, completely saturated, you know, um, or completely uh, captured the market in, in, the t in the key targets that you were targeting, like the US and Europe. So um, in other words, so if your application or if your game is, um, you know, at, at a certain point in the life cycle, um, you know, where you have captured a lot of market share in, 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 in the, in the so-called um, markets where, where the low-hanging fruit are, at the end of the life cycle, I think that Japan might, worth, uh, might be worth a look, but uh, if you are somewhere in between or at the start of, of uh, you know, distributing the game and trying to monetize it, 
I wouldn't go to Japan at that point. Any other questions? Okay, let's give a round of applause. Thank you.